episode of Noon, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Pam, a dedicated nurse who has made waves with her popular and thought-provoking social media presence. Pam's career as a nurse and her influential online platform make her a unique guest on our show. Join us for a great conversation as Pam shares her experiences in the nursing profession and discusses the ins and outs of her popular and sometimes controversial social media page. This episode promises to provide insights into both the world of healthcare and the dynamics of digital influence. Let's get started. This episode is brought to you by the 505 Central Food Hall, Albuquerque's urban food hall, which offers nine local vendors under one roof. Whether you're craving spicy hot chicken, authentic Mexican street tacos, juicy burgers and fries, comforting Japanese ramen, fresh vegetarian dishes, Detroit-style pizza, or gourmet sandwiches, you'll find it here. Alternatively, if you're just looking for somewhere to grab drinks downtown, Packies and the Moonwalk Bar offer a variety of local beer, wine, and cocktails. To stay up to date with all the special events taking place at the 505 Central Food Hall, such as Albuquerque Art Walk, live musical performances, the All drag brunch and many more follow them on instagram at 505 central that's a wrap for today's noon shout out make sure you visit the 505 central food hall because life is too short for bland meals and boring evenings thanks for tuning in and remember albuquerque's flavors and entertainment await you located in the heart of downtown albuquerque at fifth and central all right pam thank you so much for joining us on the noon podcast today i appreciate you coming out no thank you for having me I'm honored. Thank you. I I am super excited to talk to you. You've got a lot of stuff going on and, and you're a busy lady. I actually used to work with you at one of the local facilities here. Can you go ahead and give me an introduction of yourself? Yeah, I have been a nurse 10 years. I have experience in quite a few places. You know, I started in dialysis, did pediatrics, emergency room, back to dialysis in the hospital, managed a clinic when as a travel nurse into dialysis at the facility you and I met at and then did some more travel to Colorado and then now I'm back here at a local hospital different from the one we met at because my husband you know graduated nursing school and he needed some nursing experience before we traveled together I have two kids 20 and 17 my husband and I have been together 25 years total since he was 14 and I was 15. Wow yeah neither of us have been arrested for domestics yet so (laughs) that right there is an accomplishment (laughs) in itself. (laughs) Uh, I would agree with that statement I think that is an accomplishment especially in New Mexico right the domestic violence right here is right atrocious it is so high so how was it supporting your husband going through nursing school you know I'm actually proud of myself that I did growing up I never thought that I would be able to support a family, you know, on my own. And never, ever did I think I'd be able to support my family while my husband went to nursing school. It was stressful, but it was definitely rewarding, eye-opening for me, made me more confident made me value my job a lot more because not only was I working as a nurse that I worked so hard for, but I had, you know, an entire family counting on me. And my husband was amazing. And it was a struggle at times. I mean, nursing school is a struggle all in its own. But yeah, it was... It was definitely rewarding, and I learned a lot about myself in that time. No, that's great. You know, I feel for the people who are single providers, when you're supporting somebody else going through school, that is tough. Nursing school's not a joke, you know, the education system's not a joke, and you're spending a lot of money to hopefully come out with something in the end that's going to help you make more money. 
what, did he have any interest in nursing or medicine at all prior to becoming a nurse? Not really. So he was a corrections officer at the state prison for 11 and a half years. He put me through nursing school. I mean, he would take inmates to the hospital. But other than that, he really had no interest. And he definitely didn't want to go back to school. I always wanted him to go back for higher education. And he fought it. And then later on, he decided he wanted to get into nursing. He wanted to help people and be kind of opposite, I guess you could say, from being a corrections officer to, you know, caring for people that are sick instead of, you know, felons. Just something a little more rewarding, but he never thought he was smart enough. And I always knew that he was wicked smart, but just didn't have that confidence and now it's like he'll try and correct me at nursing and he's so interested <laughs> in it and I'm like hold on wait a minute like I have all this experience and you learned all this stuff in nursing school and in real life that's not how it is but you know he loves it he's in cardiac progressive care at another facility and he's just so in love with it and it's wonderful to see that confidence has blossomed in him that not only does he know he's that smart but now he's the first ever in his family to one complete high school and two to have gone through higher education and get a degree so oh that's fantastic yeah so he's pretty proud of himself i'm proud of him i mean he's an amazing role model for the rest of our family and your kids are coming into an age now where they're having to kind of decide what roads they want to go down do they have any interest in medicine they do my oldest who's 20 he was working at like a skilled slash assisted living facility and loved it he took a break from it and now he's wanting to get into acute care as a patient tech and see how he likes it before he just jumps into nursing school my 17 year old you know he's getting ready to graduate or GED, whatever you want to call it. He's trying to just test out of high school, I guess, and go straight into college. He wants to go to nursing school. So we're taking care of that. And then hopefully by January, he's enrolled in the VC down here at the college. That's awesome. You know, seeing some of the shit that we've seen, having to work in the emergency department or even in like, in your case, dialysis, right? Dialysis is terrible. That is so terrible. The things that we put our bodies through and you see a lot of horrible, hard things. Mm -hmm. Does it scare you for your family to go through those things that you're also that you've seen already? It doesn't scare me for them to experience the health issues, the trauma and stuff, because then it'll make them appreciate life more, take their health more into consideration, be a little more careful when they're out and about, hopefully avoiding accident, injury, anything like that. The one thing that scares me is you know, being used and abused by hospital staff that aren't very nice or getting a patient that's unruly and maybe getting assaulted because in all honesty, that's one of the things we face as healthcare providers is the dangers in now being assaulted by patients that we're trying to take care of. And those are the only things that scare me. It's not the actual career itself. It's just all the other shit that we get piled on us. No, that totally makes sense. And those are things right now that we're facing with short staffing, right? Short staffing means people are having to work harder than they were before. And then short staffing like insecurity where we don't have 
response times that are good in the hospital because you are getting assaulted and you don't have anybody else to come help back you up except another nurse or a tech who may not necessarily be trained in de-escalation techniques or may not be strong enough to pull yeah. whoever's on top of you pummeling you off. You know, it was just two weeks ago where I was actually assaulted by a patient and I am so thankful that you know, I had the presence of mind to call security because I knew it was going to be trouble. Earlier in the shift, the patient had thrown a full pitcher of water at me, an empty soda can and a cup. Um, called security about that. He was caught with drugs for the third time in the 12 hours he had been admitted. Wow. We suspect he was hiding them in the bandages on his wound that he wouldn't let anybody assess. He was very aggressive, very verbally abusive. We had video monitoring in there. I had called security, but he had already shot up whatever he shot up and we couldn't just do an involuntary discharge with him being high on whatever. You know, so we had to let him sleep it off and lab came in and ended up trying to draw blood and he screamed and I was like, okay, he's awake, let's get him out. I knew it was going to be an issue. So I called security to assist me and they sent an officer and I was attempting to, you know, pull out the IV and it was going smooth until the tape pulled his hair he drew back went to hit me and that's when the security officer like threw him back on the bed but he had already made contact on my arm i thought it was his blood on me went and washed my arm right away and there was blood on the paper towel and that's when i looked down and realized that i had a cut from his nails Ugh. and i'm bleeding yeah, that's scary. Yeah. And then to press charges, they wouldn't arrest him because he wasn't medically cleared. And he's not going to get medically cleared because he's refusing any and all treatment. So it's like, what happened? Yeah, you're bringing up a really good point, right? Because there is such a fine line between getting discharged for being aggressive, but how much of this aggression is due to neuro problems versus being high on drugs? Mm -hmm. You know, like there's, it is such a fine line. And I think that's what's prompted us having as many abuse issues as we do have, even to this day. You know, I saw, I saw a meme the other day and it might've been on your group page. I don't remember, but it said, if, uh, if a cop gets assaulted, the person goes to prison. If a judge gets assaulted, the person goes to prison. If a nurse gets assaulted, it's, well, what did you do wrong? Yeah, I was lucky that my unit manager was actually in the room at the time with me and she's the one that I didn't notice he had drawn back to hit me and she asked me you know did he punch you and I'm like no it was his nail that scraped me she's like I saw him draw back I thought he punched you because that was her perspective standing behind me that's what she saw Mm -hmm. He was very supportive of me. So I was very lucky there. But yeah, I have heard peers that have been assaulted that that's the case. What could you have done better? How could you have de-escalated that situation more? Yeah. And it's like at a certain point with certain patients, you can try and de-escalate all you want. You can try and use all of your trainings that you want but certain patients it's just not effective with right it's hard and some of these patients are it, I, honestly coming up through the ems system on my side you know we get a little bit of de-escalation training but not really a lot and i think that's something especially with all of the uh use of the doj recently they've started increasing amongst the police officers you know is that de-escalation training so i feel like they're probably getting a lot more training than we are, right? Hopefully you got checked out to make sure you didn't get anything from that guy. I did. And then the crime scene investigator for the police department ended up taking photos and 
you know, I had a really great officer and she was checking up on me. Security officers were checking up on me. My nurse manager was, but yeah, I'm very lucky. It was just what it was and it wasn't worse. Well, it's good also that you had the, the wherewithal to realize that this guy was already an issue. So you were able to call in security and it sounds like you had a couple of extra hands in there just in case it did go south any further than it did. Yeah. It's pretty nuts with all the shootings we're seeing inside the hospitals and inside the clinics now too. You know, where's the line? You know, the hospital that we worked at had metal detectors, but they were the handheld metal detectors by security. So people that walked in Probably 98% of the people that came in didn't get searched. No. Well, and I remember a case that we had. It was a few kids got shot outside of a pizza place. Um, They brought one of the kids into the trauma bay. The story was, was that none of these kids that got shot were armed. And, you know, come to find out the kid that was in the trauma bay and bless his heart, he didn't make it. He was about my oldest son's age. He ended up having a gun in his front. And it's like, what the heck? You know, like, yeah, yeah I, I don't know how certain things get past police and make it into the hospital. Because what if, you know, it's scary. That is scary. And that kind of should have stemmed from EMS, right? Because if you're bringing in a shooting victim, uh, the first thing you should be doing is getting that person trauma naked, right? Because you want to make sure they don't have any gunshots anywhere else and they can't speak for that team or, or that crew or anything else. But I mean, that should have probably been identified fairly early. Mm-hmm. Had the kid, you know, been awake enough, though, and altered... They, they put themselves at great risk, and then they also put you guys at great risk, and the PD officers at great risk because he wasn't made naked to check and do a full assessment on him. Yeah. That's scary. Uh, we had a motorcyclist who was trying to cross. He had gotten off on the wrong exit, and so he was trying to go straight through the intersection, and he didn't see the median in the middle, and he wrecked his bike. And I think he ended up having a broken leg. And most motorcyclists will carry a weapon on them. Understandable. I'm all for it. As long as you have all the right stuff, you know. And I told him, if you have a piece on you, you need to either give it to the police department or you need to call somebody to come pick it up because we're not going to take it to the hospital with us. I don't think that you're going to shoot us. You know, you seem fairly stable minded, but things happen when people become altered. And he was a little upset at me, but he called a friend in to come and pick up that weapon for us. It's something that I think a lot of people are afraid to ask, but then if you're not asking, you're asking for more trouble than you than it would be worth. Yeah. There was a situation when I was a pediatric nurse in which eventually led to me going into the ED. It was a drug-addicted baby that was born, and the parents were there, and... I was doing like a five day stretch, I think. And each of those days I had this family and I had told them so many times, you know, don't leave the baby on the bed without supervision. And I was having to place the baby in the bassinet over and over. And we eventually moved them to where they were closer to the nurse's station and we could see them better. I had heard an altercation in the room and I told them, you need to take it outside. This isn't the place to do it. I mean, it was, it was night shift. It had to have been like nine, 10 o'clock at night. So I asked them to leave, take it off the unit, settle what they're going to settle. I'll watch the baby. So I go into the room to get, you know, diapers and stuff for the baby As I'm in there, I see knives, not just one, not just two. There had to have been like four or five knives in the room, just laying there on the chair. We call security and we call the house soup. They come up. Dad finally comes in right after they've searched the room. They found like needles, drugs, all of that. Security searches the room, confiscates the knives. The dad comes up to the unit and 
as I'm standing there on the phone with the CYFD lady that was handling the case, he starts yelling at me and my charge tells me, you know, go into the treatment room. So I go into the treatment room. I have the baby in there and I hear like security tackle him outside the room that I've kind of barricaded me and the baby in threatening to kill me. So then forward a few months and I'm subpoenaed to testify against this family. They ended up getting their parental rights terminated and everything, but it was that experience. Oh, back up. Security returned his knives to him just outside the unit and we witnessed it on the monitor. I had to call my husband and there was another security officer that was coming in for days that ended up knowing me and my husband, you know, personally, they worked at the prison together that escorted me out because they returned the knives to him. I feared for my safety, but then I ended up having to testify against them. And I was like, nah, I'm done with peds. I'm done. I ended up transferring to the ED and it was great. I mean, it gave me my thick skin. I don't tolerate anything like I used to. I'm really good at setting boundaries. So yeah, it takes experiences like that to really open your eyes to what the world is capable of against, you know, healthcare workers. It's absolutely mind blowing. It is mind-blowing, and that sounds like it was a scary situation. I'm glad that you had the resources to come back and help kind of get you into and out of the hospital for a few days, because you just never know. You don't know how people are going to react. No. That's scary. And then drug babies. Ugh, we have so many of those here. It's so sad. Like, no wonder our, you know, our CYFD system is so overrun, and that these kids are just coming out so bad. Ugh, that one's rough. A lot of them don't even have the good start, I mean. I know. Yeah, it's nuts. You know, New Mexico's poor, and we just keep making it worse for ourselves as a state. You know, we're not we're not stepping it up to make it any better, which is, is unfortunate. You had mentioned getting a thick skin at, in the ER. What, <laughs> what happened to give you a thick skin? What kind of trouble were you getting into? Oh, my goodness. You know, in dialysis, you have to be kind of censored and watch what you say, you know, in the clinic. You're around some patients that they're pretty sensitive. And then in peds, you have to be all butterflies and rainbows. Yes. And then I step into the ED and I'm like, these are my people. I mean, that dark <laughs> sense of humor I could finally let out. And I was like, hell yeah, this is great. <laughs> and then being able to tell patients like, look, I'm not keeping you here. If you don't want to be here, I don't want you here either. You can go, you know? Yeah. Um, patients telling you off and it's like, I don't have to take this. It's more acceptable to tell a patient, you need to cut your shit, like knock it off. We're trying to help you not hurt you. If you want care, you need to cut your shit. And then it's just that sense of humor and that camaraderie that you have with your coworkers within the ED where you know you can count on them in the scariest of situations because you literally don't know what's coming in that door. You have no idea. It may be stomach pain and they're out there eating hot Cheetos and drinking a big gulp and getting ready to be discharged and it turns out they're in DIC which I've seen um, oh gosh is something as crazy as a girl coming in with a butt plug stuck so far up her that <laughs> we had to get a speculum but she said it was her <laughs> quote unquote first time and then you look uh -huh. <laughs> the like history of her visits and it's like Oh, no, honey, this isn't your first time, <laughs> like, maybe with this guy, but, yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, you see some crazy.
crazy stuff and you get to see some cool stuff, you know, and it makes you more confident. It makes you able to approach any situation, think quickly on your feet. I mean, it was just a wonderful experience. No, that's great. And it sounds like that may have been what led you to making your Facebook group page. Oh, boy, was it ever. So <laughs> so I run Asshole Nurses on Facebook. Hopefully most of y'all are members. If not, you're totally missing out. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> right? I started it as a digital kind of break room just for me and two of my coworkers. And we were having fun, like passing memes back and forth. And I woke up one morning and, you know, I had 200 members and then it went to a thousand. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And now, you know, we've had the group, I think it's been, what, since 2017, I think. And yeah, there's over 10,000 members. And I've heard from people, not just at the facility it was born at, but, you know, other facilities where they hear my name and they're like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. And then they find out, you know, that's my group. I've heard from other people, from other facilities, even as a traveler, that they've worked at places where they were warned by their managers not to be part of this group called Asshole <laughs> Nurses. Really? That is such a compliment. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. You know, that's great. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always warn members, one rule is no snitching, you know, just, you don't like it, scroll on. Um, you don't have to go and tattle, we're adults, come on. No politics and no religion. You know, I don't care what anybody's religion is. You could worship a golf ball. I don't care, but I don't want it on that page it doesn't belong there like i said it's a digital break room mainly dedicated to our sick and twisted fucked up dark minds you know why do you think the hospital management is so opposed to your group page i think and this is my own opinion i think that a lot of people try to paint healthcare as cupcakes, rainbows, and unicorns that we're all just wonderful and great and we just love our jobs and everything is just wonderful. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want like the truth to be seen by the public and that's fine. That's one of the reasons why, you know, first Asshole Nurses went from a public group to a private group to now it's a secret group where you can't even find it on a search. And if you do, that's not the original. It has to be by invite only. I think that there was a lot of sticking it to the coworker you didn't like because they posted something and then you go and tattle to the manager and they get in trouble. I do think that the hospitals are trying to paint a picture that we're all professional and we just have these wonderful experiences and that's not true i think they're trying to sugarcoat a lot of shit and i've always lived by the motto my grandpa had was you can't sugarcoat shit and you can't put lipstick on a pig and call it cute like you just have to be <laughs> what it is you know, we need an outlet other than therapy and psychiatry and mental health drugs. You know, those are fine, too. I mean, I'm, I'm on them, whatever. <laughs> I have no qualms in admitting that. But we need that community where we know that others are thinking the same way we are. Because I thought I was just fucked up in the head for thinking all this shit, like, getting so mad and frustrated or laughing at the craziest things. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I have a hard time 
not using puns around amputees. <laughs> Horrible. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I've been known to make comments to patients that I can't trust them because they have not a leg to stand on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have issues or telling a patient that they're half the woman they used to be. Oh my God. <laughs> right. I mean, it sounds like to me, it just sounds like you're trying to break the ice, right? Make that patient a little more comfortable with what's going on. Yeah. And it's, it's true. I think we do get put a lot of stigmas on us to maintain this professional, you know, all jokes aside manner when we're in the hospital. And I'm sorry, but when you get that many of us together and sitting at a desk or hanging out in a room where we're having to do some of the grossest things we've ever seen or smelled in our lives, we have to make fun of it, you know, because how else are we going to hope relieve that so have have you gotten any any bad feedback or have you had any problems getting jobs because of that Facebook group? No. No. I've told managers before, just a heads up, this is my Facebook group because I didn't want it to come out secondhand. So there have been times where I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know that I do run a Facebook group this is what it's called it's just like an outlet for us healthcare workers um it's just something to laugh at and help us cope with what we see and i haven't had any issues i really haven't knock on wood you know like i was saying earlier starting that group i thought it was just me and the other two like us joking around and i was like man okay they're messed up in the head too. And then to see the community grow in the group, it makes me feel better that I'm not the only one with that fucked up sense of humor and laughing through the traumas and all the bad crap we see and just being able to joke. I always tell people, you know, when they're private messaging, me or the other two admins that they got in trouble for posting this and posting that i'm like you post at your own risk i mean if you put what facility you're at or divulge something that someone else can identify that patient with that's all on you that's not me you need to take accountability and responsibility for what you post and you do. You have to post at your own risk, just like your personal page. Yeah, it's true. You're posting at your own risk. And just because you're posting on somebody else's page doesn't mean that you're not responsible for your your own actions, right? And that's why maybe the social media policies have gotten to the point where they are today, where almost any social media can be a bad thing for some companies, you know? Yeah. And that's the funny part is every now and then I'll get a notification that a post was taken down because it was against Facebook standards and it was inappropriate. And I'm like, well, no shit. The whole, the whole group is inappropriate. Like, come on. Come on. <laughs> These Facebook standards have kind of dulled everything. There's some things where I'm like, okay, I, I can see why that was removed because it makes me feel a little, oh, cringy. <laughs> but there's some where it's like, oh, come on. Like, I got put in Facebook jail because I posted a joke about Jeffrey Dahmer and, and a handshake. Like, how does Jeffrey Dahmer shake hands? He puts them in a blender. Oh, <laughs> I was banned from Facebook for like a week. Jeez. <laughs> now that's pretty funny. <laughs> right? It's fucked up, but it's funny. <laughs> But that's how we get through our days, you know, and it's, yeah. I mean, it's hard, I think, for the lay person to understand, again, that is, you know, part of the trauma that we have, and we just have to let it out sometimes in really, really poor senses of humor. Yeah. Well, and look at all these healthcare workers that 
I've unfortunately lost a couple of really, really good friends to suicide over the last couple of years because they didn't feel they had an outlet. They didn't feel like they had anybody that they could go to. And one of them just hit me so hard because I had just talked to her a month before. I mean, we would go months without talking and pick right up where we left off. And, you know, she was looking forward to spending time with her granddaughter and the new grandbaby that um, just came into the world and, you know, just so excited. And I find out a month later that she killed herself and it was just mind blowing, but she felt like she couldn't go to anybody. Nobody would understand. And I want to make sure that, you know, we're there for our peers, our coworkers, because even though you may be going through something you think nobody else is, there's somebody else in our healthcare community that may be going through the exact same thing. So, you know, anonymous posts are great for that, you know, reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm going through this, this, and this. I just need someone to talk to. And that's one thing I love about us whole nurses is that even though we have inappropriate dark humor and stuff, we've come, we've come together as a community a few times. And I know I was going through a really rough part where I didn't care if I lived or died. It was, I felt it was at my lowest of lows. And I ended up opening up to, she's another member on the group and she has her own Facebook group too. Um, we've never met in person, but she was checking on me every day, every, every day. And I think she helped me a lot. She really helped me in a way where, yeah, I have my family, I have all of their support, but it was someone on the outside actually showing that they care and that they get me because of what we were seeing. And it was at the height of COVID where I'm sitting there in ICU and trying to run a patient on dialysis. And I am seeing body after body after body after body pass by me to go down that cell set of elevators to my right to take them downstairs to the morgue. And that was my breaking point. You know, I've seen death, I've seen dead bodies, but it was the, the amount. I mean, I lost count in just that five hours I was down there. And that I think broke my mind. And, you know, she was wonderful. She understood because she was seeing a lot of it too. And my family thankfully didn't see that. So yeah, I think it's it's a good community too, even though it's called asshole nurses. We're not assholes all the time. <laughs> I would agree. And how would somebody go about um, getting access to it now that it's private? Or you said secret, it's a secret Facebook group. So it's gotta be a member of the group that invites a friend. And then myself and the other two admins, we get the notification that so-and-so wants to join. And there are three questions. It's, are you a nurse? Or if not, are you another healthcare worker? Um, there's the question, you know, are you a snitch? Um, and then the question, are you a Nigerian prince? Because somehow we ended up with one in the group when it first started and there was a lot of emailing to send him money. <laughs> yeah. So one of the prerequisites, one of the requirements, I guess you should say, of being a member 
is not being a snitch and not being a Nigerian prince. Well, that's good. Um, and I, I prefer healthcare workers because we see things that the general public doesn't. Sure. Unfortunately, it has to be that way to where it's a private group and you have to know somebody to get in. You can always message me on Facebook if you want to get in. It's Pamela with two L's, Rochelle, R-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, Chavez with a Z. Just message me in the messenger and say you want to be added. And I'll put that in on the episode too. I'll put all, I'll put your links in on the episode when your episode posts. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that you were at a low point, but I'm really glad that you had the community behind you, even if it, you know, was only that one person that you were able to reach out and get that help that you needed, you know, and sometimes it does just take the words from a stranger to help checking in on us. Yeah, she was able to see through my bullshit. Nobody else saw that I was drowning and it ended up where I found out more about my mental health and stuff than I knew before and now I'm I'm golden I'm good (laughs) oh good I think a lot of people found out a lot about their mental health going through COVID you know on both sides right because you took a bunch of people who had jobs and then you took their jobs away and you put them at home to their own devices and then you took people who had jobs that were healthcare workers or you know essential workers who were now having to work double triple the amount that they were working before and seeing a lot harder things so i think i think that broke us all on different levels yeah i absolutely i totally agree what would you say has been probably your your most favorite case something that's made you happy or proud to be where you're at it wasn't in the ed and it wasn't in dialysis it was actually at the last facility i was at doing end of life care it was a patient that she was elderly she was like in her 80s her and her husband had been married like they were getting ready to celebrate their 70th wedding anniversary so she was in her mid to late 80s had breast cancer that had metastasized through her body to her bones when she came in to me she was super feisty really sarcastic we hit it off right away she was just wonderful and then the first thing she would say when you walked into the room was no needles and i had to promise her you know no needles i babied that iv that she had i had to advocate for her that you know she doesn't want any more needles she didn't want any more pokes nothing invasive i got so pissed one night when I came in, it was day. I had just switched to day shift, God help me. And uh, the night shift nurse had inserted a Foley. And the first thing the patient did was she grabbed my hand and she tells me, Pam, they hurt me last night. I told them no, and they did it anyway. And that killed me. They tried drawing blood from her, lost her lab. So they came to do it again. And I found out and I was pissed. I was so pissed because I promised her no more. I had her four or five days in a row. So this was over a course. And it got to a point where she was on such a high need for oxygen. She was on heated high flow, maxed out. And I couldn't wean her. And she was barely satting at 90, 91. She had dipped down to the mid 80s. There was no weaning her. There was no way. We couldn't take her for an MRI or a CT scan because there was such a high requirement of oxygen. We just couldn't. And unfortunately, well, I don't even know. Unfortunately, fortunately, I was put in a position where I had to talk to the husband and the family about into life care because they wanted to take her home. And I had to explain to them that there's no going home right now she requires so much oxygen on a special machine that in the ambulance ride home she'll she'll pass she was so tiny that cpr would have been a nightmare and she was a dnr but 
it was the advocating for her. The night that she passed, I ended up working from 6.30 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night because I was giving her morphine every 20 minutes, eight milligrams of morphine every 20 minutes. And um, before she passed, the day that I started the end of life care, her favorite hobby was crocheting. And that's one of my hobbies too. And I brought her some yarn and a crochet hook. She had like a moment of lucidity and she tells her husband to go home and get the pot holders that she made for the church craft sale and to give them to me. So he came and he brought me, it had to have been 20 pot holders that she had crocheted. And I sat him there on my desk and, you know, I, I had started the end of life care. It had to have been like at three. And, you know, every 20 minutes it's the morphine and I'm going in there and the family's like hugging me and thanking me and calling me an angel. And I'm like, why, you know, it, into life care, I don't think ever gets easier. And you're fighting with your, you know, you're giving these high doses of morphine every 20 minutes. And it's like, am I facilitating it or am I helping it? Like, I always have that argument in my head. But anyway, when her respirations became more agonal and labored, despite the morphine, the husband tells me, Pam, you need to take the pot holder she was making you because, you know, she was crocheting. And I'm like, I know, I know. And I had been dreading it all day. And I go to lift back the blanket and she's in mid stitch. And he tells me, maybe you can figure out the stitch that she was doing for the pot holder. And I said, no, you know, I'm going to tie it off and I'm going to leave it like this. And, you know, I continued and everything. And finally, my charge nurse kicks me out of the hospital because I was already at, I don't know, 17, 18 hours, something like that. Like it was, I don't even remember. And one of my coworkers messages me at three in the morning and she tells me, I just want to let you know that she passed at 1 a.m. Well, then fast forward and my recruiter is emailing me, oh, I heard that you took care of this patient and the end of life care. And I felt great about it because, you know, she wasn't suffering and I helped her ease comfortably and, you know, as much as I could. And I was okay with it. I mean, that's, that's our job. And the doctor had praised me and told me I did great and he appreciated you know the compassion I showed to the family and my recruiter found out about it um, because my manager of that unit emailed her fast forward a couple of months and I find out that this lead asshole is nominated for the motherfucking daisy award I'm like <laughs> um and it's not just because of that it was because the relationship that I built with that patient and the, the advocating and all the fight that I had to put out there just to make sure that her wishes were heard and respected. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's what that's what we're supposed to do as healthcare workers, especially nurses. We advocate for our patients. We want what's best for them. And yeah, I felt good about it. And the family was at ease and they were at peace with her passing. And that's what sticks with me. So it's not the Daisy Award because I had come to terms long, long ago that I would never receive a Daisy. And I'm okay with that because I don't kiss ass. I'm not going to go above and beyond just for a pin, you know? So when I was nominated, I was shocked. I was shocked. And then to find out that I was nominated by the doctor, that right there kind of confirmed that we can have doctors that really appreciate what we're doing. 
even though him and I had had a couple of conversations on what was best for the patient, he was more on page with me than the consulting specialist. But it was that respect that he showed me that I really appreciated. But that I will never forget. They sent me flowers a couple of days later, and they wrote me a little thank you note that I keep in my stethoscope case for when I have the asshole patients or when I'm like, you know, I really fucking hate people and I wish I worked for OMI. Like, those patients don't need anything except a spritz of a breeze every now and then. Like, <laughs> that would be best. But, yeah, I look at that thank you note and... I remember that right there is why I do what I do, why I am still a nurse and haven't given up yet. There is still some humanity out there in the world. There is still some compassion and gratefulness for what we do in the healthcare profession. Yeah, no, I agree. That's a great example. End of life care is something I don't think that I could do emotionally. I couldn't do it. So props to the people who do do end of life care, you know, every day or even for a short period of time. And, you know, you're going to be in that family's thoughts forever now because you helped advocate in such a big way for that patient. That's awesome, Pam. Strong work. Thank you. So um, what would you say has been one of your worst cases? I saw so many high profile abuse cases when I was working at the level one trauma and pediatrics. We got, you know, those high profile cases and sexual abuse where mom was claiming that it was the daycare, but you could see cigarette burns all over the little girl's genitals and hair pulled out of her head. I've seen a little girl that the family was trying to punish her and put her in an ice bath. And the only thing that saved her life was the cold temperature of the bath slowed down her organs enough to where she was able to live. I've seen a 13 year old that had shot himself in the head um, because he was afraid his parents were going to get mad that he had got bad grades on his report card. Yeah, it's it was the kids that really was the worst. There is an adult case that kind of stands out, and it was a gentleman where he had just found out that his liver disease was terminal, and I went in to um, kind of wash him up, one day and he's despondent like before him and I are joking around and we had like that camaraderie together and he's just kind of withdrawn and I asked him you know if everything was okay and he looks at me and he tells me you know I think the worst part of all of this is knowing that you're dying you know it kind of puts in perspective when you get a terminal diagnosis and you know you're dying. I hope I never experienced that. I hope none of my family or friends experienced that. I think to have that thought so heavy in your mind that your life is over, you know, dialysis patients that I've grown close to committing suicide, cutting up their fistula because they don't want to go on anymore and they've bled out and we, you know, they weren't found until they're late for their treatment and we have to do a wellness check and the cops find the blood all over or they save up their pain meds for a couple of months and end up overdosing on them i mean there's not just one case that sticks out to be the absolute worst because it's like every one of the sad ones hits you a little different they hit like a certain part of your heart, your soul, your brain, like everything different to where that's going to stick with you too. And that's going to stick with you too. And you're going to go forward taking care of your patient still with that in the back of your mind, but hoping that you don't see it again, but knowing that you probably will. I think that is the hardest. So not just one, but the everything as a whole. Sure. The overall 
general consensus on everything. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate. I would agree. It sounds like, though, that it was good that you got out of Pete's when you did because it, ugh, Pete's is rough. Yeah, and I didn't like the mom I was. I was a helicopter mom. My kids weren't allowed to go trick-or-treating. I didn't want them going over to a friend's house. I didn't want them on a trampoline. I didn't want them, you know, out on dirt bikes because I didn't want them to get abused sexually, physically, none of that. I wanted to protect them as much as possible. And, you know, at the time I was in Peds, my husband was a corrections officer and we agreed that, you know, Halloween is scary because you don't know who's on the other side of that door and you're delivering your kids to a potential pedophile. You know, and mm -hmm. it's scary and that's what sticks with you because they look like everyone else. So my kids, I'm like, no, we'll have a party at the house. Everybody can dress up, bring candy. Like, we'll just do that. And yeah, I, it was where I don't think my kids were really enjoying their childhood at that time because I was so protective. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's scary. So, and you've kind of discussed a little bit about all of the different options that you've had, but what have you gone through to kind of battle the traumas that you've dealt with? What steps have you taken? Other than the break in my mental health, I, I ended up kind of admitting to myself that, you know, I needed more than just someone to talk to. Yes, it was great. I had someone that understood but I needed professional help and I sought out, you know, psychiatry and therapy. And it was at a point where I was seeing two therapists a week and I needed that. I had never really had anxiety before, but I would find myself not able to breathe or move or really do anything. And I would have the thoughts, you know, what if I just drove off the cliff and died in a fiery crash and the only thing I cared about was I would ruin my car and not be able to leave it for my husband and kids. That was all I was worried about. The psychiatry and the therapy really helped me and then finding out through all of that journey that what I suspected for years was actually true. And I'm very open about my mental health and I'm not ashamed of it at all because if I can help someone else through it, then fine. Um, that's, that's wonderful. I was diagnosed as bipolar two on top of the ADHD with general anxiety and now I have insomnia, but coping with all of that and still talking to my therapist, even though she says I don't need her anymore, I'm like, no, I do. So I didn't let her. <laughs> don't take me. this away from me, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, you're stuck with me. Um, so it's kind of against her will. <laughs> I've never heard of it that way. <laughs> well, and my cousin heard her say, yeah, I don't think you need me anymore. And I'm all, uh, yeah, I do. I may be okay now, but what about like tomorrow or next week? No, I'm still fucked up in the head. I still need therapy. Yeah. So she's stuck with me. Um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm very open about it and I'm not ashamed because my friend helped me through it and I want to help others through it. I don't want anyone to think they're alone. I don't want them to end up where, like we were talking about, friends and acquaintances have killed themselves because they didn't think they had anyone to go to, and I don't want anybody to feel like they have to go through it alone. I agree, and I, I hope that sharing the, these episodes, you know, more and more that people are learning that they're not alone. And in having a varying degree of people come in and talk on the show, you know, I want people to see that we're everywhere. Yeah. The, the help is everywhere. You can reach out to anybody. You can reach out to any of my guests that have been on the show. You know, if you uh, feel like you're alone and you need to talk, 
So that's good. Yeah, and you don't have to be ashamed of it. You don't because no. somebody else may be hiding it and they're just waiting for someone to open up so then you guys can go through it together and help each other through it. I mean, it just takes that one person not being ashamed or just saying, you know what, I can't hold it in anymore. I need to talk to someone. And then them saying, oh my gosh, me too. I feel that same way. And then being each other's support and hopefully getting the help that they need. I mean, I never thought I would break down and do psychiatric help. You know, I knew that I needed it because of childhood stuff and just issues I was having in my own head. I never thought I would break down to actually do it, but it has helped so much. I feel like me again. I feel like I don't have to pretend to be happy. I can just be me and I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable in my own skin and it takes a lot to get there and sometimes you can't do it by yourself sometimes a friend isn't gonna be you know all that you need so people need to know that you don't have to be ashamed or embarrassed to get psychiatric help i mean all joking aside i'm very open about it i think it was what was best for me and i think that a lot of people like i said would benefit from it so yeah I'm glad that you're so open about it. You know, there there is, again, that huge stigma that keeps people from feeling like they can open about it, I think, for, you know, fear of losing their job or losing their position or being told that maybe they're not in the right position. That's such a statement that I'm so sick of hearing. You know, maybe you're not in the right job or maybe this isn't the job for you. Yeah. Well, we're all allowed to have bad days. We're all allowed to feel down. We're allowed to have those bad calls that make us feel shittier than other days, you know? And in that, I'm allowed to talk about it. I'm allowed to openly discuss how I'm feeling. I'm allowed to feel this way. I'm allowed to to feel however I want to feel about whatever call I just had. Just give me the space to talk about it, right? So, all right, Pamela. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great conversation. I've had an absolute blast. (laughs) Me too. Me too. Love it. Is there anything you want to shout out before we close up? No, just find me on Facebook. I mean, we can see if you qualify for asshole nurses, but that's pretty much it. I mean, I've enjoyed talking to you sam thank you for having me awesome no thank you so much if you ever need anything feel free to reach out you have you have my email you have my phone number you have all that all right oh thank you yes thanks pam i appreciate it i hope you have a good rest of your day i hope you do too thanks sam thanks pam bye bye Thank you for listening. Before we wrap up, we have a few important announcements to share with you. Firstly, we're excited to announce the launch of our brand new 911 Nonsense Facebook group page. It's a community where everyone can go to connect, share ideas, discuss topics from the show, and get all of the most recent updates about the podcast. We'd love to have you join us and be part of the conversation. Next, we want to ask you to rate and review our podcast on your preferred platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach a wider audience. By rating and reviewing the show, you'll be supporting us in a big way and helping others discover 911 nonsense. If you enjoy what we do and would like to support the podcast even further, we have a few options available. You can visit samspursuit.com to find the links to our 911 nonsense merch page and our recently released noon gear page. Every contribution, no matter the size, goes a long way in helping us continue to better the podcast. We know that not everyone is comfortable being on the podcast, but we still want to hear your stories and experiences. If you have a compelling story and would like to share it to be read by me in a future episode, please reach out to us via email at 911nonsense at gmail.com or through our website's contact section. If you choose to be anonymous, we'll make sure to respect your privacy while sharing your story in a way that resonates with our audience. Thank you again for tuning in. We truly appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more engaging content in the future. See you next week.